everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today we've got a great guest who I think you guys are going to like because he's a smart guy, or conceivably it's an engineer in a uh, CTO office at Seagate. So I think we've got the guy to answer all the questions about what's going on with storage, what's the technical uh, limitations, opportunities, uh, and all sorts of other things around hard drives and other technologies. Uh, so happy. Colin, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Yeah, it's great to be here, Brian. Thanks very much. Really, really big fan of the uh, podcast and, and all the work you guys do. Well, we, we appreciate that. And we're always glad to have a, uh, a technician, if, if that's fair. Well, I know your background's in engineering, but tell us a little bit more about uh, where you come from. Yeah, so uh, almost 25 years in the industry. Uh, IBM back in the day originally, but I've been most of my career at Seagate. Uh, maybe you can tell from my accent. I'm not originally from the US, but I uh, grew up in, in the UK and went and worked for IBM there. But uh, now, been in Minnesota now for more than 20 years, um, working at Seagate, uh, working in Shackby in the Minnesota office. I my So my role is uh, director of the office of CTO. Uh, my career has been pretty much in hard drive research and development. Uh, out of our design center here, we've had a long history of our enterprise products, and so worked on various of those. Um, just love the industry, love the technology. Um, I now have a team of people looking at more of the future-looking technologies outside the disk uh, as well. Um, but my, you know, my blood bleeds rust, should we say, or in terms of the uh, the hard drive <laughs> technology, uh, and I still am amazed by what we've been able to do and, and how, how far we've come. So, so uh, we'll, get, we'll get into all that. I've got a more important question that, uh, that needs to be answered. So you've been in the U.S. for a couple decades now. Are you still a, a footballer? Were you a, a football fan in, in, your, in your prior uh, days in the U.K.? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So it's, um, the problem I have now is I have too many sports to follow. I don't know if anybody's following the, the Rugby World Cup, but I have football, as we would call it football and and rugby formula one cricket as well as adopting the u.s sports too so all right we're, we're gonna get into the hard drives but first we stay with sports uh, please don't disappoint me and, and tell me you're a tottenham fan i'm not a tottenham fan i'm afraid <laughs> um my local team is actually portsmouth um, oh, okay. which nobody's heard of um they're pretty low in the divisions but i've kind of adopted liverpool more recently i Really like that. I like how they're doing, but yeah, not Tottenham or Arsenal. I'm afraid can't can't do those London teams. Well, okay. Well, I'm I'm an Arsenal fan, but see, the the reason is I, I didn't I didn't come into it when they were on top because obviously they haven't been been there in, in quite some time. Last year uh, aside, you know, being from Cincinnati, we always uh, like the the Reds baseball team never was a big money team, and now obviously that's changed in, in soccer dramatically over even the last decade. But it was all about homegrown talent and, and developing players. And I always respected what Arsenal did there to grow young talent. So when I came into you know, get, enjoying uh, European football, I really stuck to that. Now, on the other side, on, on F1, I'm a Ferrari fan. So I don't know what I have to say about the same, <laughs> the same team selection uh, uh, decision-making process. But, you know... It, well, they, they come turn. around, right? They, they come around, and Arsenal have come good, and maybe this will be their year. I mean, they had a little bit of a choke at the end of last year, right? But uh, you probably how dare you a choke? Sorry, I have to use the choke word. I think a lot of people <laughs> do, but I think this year they uh, they could do it. So, uh, but yeah, Ferrari we'll is uh, another difficult one, right? They haven't returned to their glory days yet either. <laughs> no, it. Uh... It, it, it may still be some time before we, we see that. And uh, I was, thought we were done with the soccer, but then you said chokes. So I had to come back to it. You know, I think it's exhaustion that okay. killed them last year. Lack of depth, I think, is another way to say it. But uh, in any event, uh, I'm sure the audience is, uh, is either skipped forward three minutes or tuned out. But let's get them, let's see if we can re engage them okay. on, uh, on, on spinning rust, as, as you said. <laughs> It's funny to me that uh, what should be a pejorative is pretty broadly embraced <laughs> by those in the hard drive uh, technology space. You, you don't have any problem with that, huh? Oh, no, no. I, I think, um, you, know, you know, people obviously see hard drives. They've been around a long time. They see flash. They see other technologies, right? But I think for the people near to the industry, um, you know, I think people are really 
amazed by the technology that's inside these devices. And it just keeps on growing and growing and growing, right? The, just the, the level of expertise required to do what hard drives do um, really is immense, right? It, the nanoscale technology, the, the level at which we fly heads over disks for the period we do and the workloads we use them use and potentially abuse these devices um, and essentially have got them to a commodity level with the level of technology inside them. Um, yeah, we can wear that with a badge of honor. I think it's it's survived over the, the period of time and we're really just getting started and we're now into a, a new era where we get even more capability. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll let people use those words, that's fine. But I think people that are, are really following the industry know that really the, the world is really run on hard drives. I mean, the, the cloud is essentially hard drives, right? That, that is what it is. And there really is no technology that can displace them in the next decade in terms of the amount of data that needs to be stored. So we know what we need to do. We've got a lot of work to do to get there. But um, yeah, we'll let, we'll let people say what they like to say about hard drives and we'll just get to work. Well, so, so tell me about that. Do you feel like the because we see it as consumers of, of hard drives or like me specifically as a reviewer, you guys will send us new drives and it'll be, you know, hey, we went from 16 to 18 or to 20 to 22. And, and it's, it's at times, it's these progressive increments that are, you know, I will call it, you know, kind of small, although maybe your perspective is different. Uh, but the technology required to enable that jump with adding another platter or two, adding helium, adding... Uh, more bits on on the media, adding more arms. I mean, we can talk about all of these things. I do you think maybe that it's just appears easier than it is to just grow? I mean, it just it seems maybe organic to outside looking in. Yeah, it's very easy. You know, when you just look at the the spec sheets of these devices, right? As you say, we've been kind of going along on this two terabyte um, sort of tick here. Um, and I suppose it, 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 it isn't obvious the technology that needs to, to do those things. Um, but if we look back across history, we've already had some major points of aerial density technology. And then in between, we've had, um, essentially, we, we call those kind of the inflection points of our S-curves, right? And then between those S-curve points, we have a general miniaturization of components and, and things that happen to get, and get us up those, those points. Um, so yeah, between one of those, whether you pick a number, 14 and 16, 16 and 18, there may be a hundred things, right, that get us from there, from one to the other, that are beneath the curtain, you know, behind the curtain that we don't advertise that, that we need to do to, to kind of get from one to the other. Um, but if we look back, you know, in terms of what those big points are, I mean, longitudinal recording was back in the day, bits lying down, right, and then we went to perpendicular recording. That was a that was a massive change for the industry. Um, and And just observing the capacity trend you know, until you plot it out, you don't really see, but there's definitely that point of inflection where the growth rate really went went up significantly. Um, and we were able to ride that for a, a long time, um, as well as adding platters, right? And we've, we've been doing that for the last few years, a combination of adding some capacity, but also adding platters because our perpendicular recording technology is starting to run out of legs. And that's industry accepted, right? That we are getting close to the ability for our perpendicular recording media structures to be stable, um, thermally stable, magnetically stable over time. We're getting really close to that limit. Well, why, why did, talk, talk about that for a second before you, you go on. Can you describe more deeply what, the, what that means? Why can't we just keep jumping at, at two terabyte increments on, on uh, uh, CMR or you know, type of uh, media for the next you know, decades? What, what, what's the engineering limitation there, the physical limitation? So, yeah, there's two, so there's two things. There's area and there's aerial density, right? And they're very different things. So when we talk about area, we talk about maximizing the disk size within the form factor. Mm -hmm. So three and a half inch drives are the de facto standard now in pretty much all deployments. So that's, there's only a physically certain disk size you can fit in that thing. Uh, we use 97 millimeter disks. That's pretty much as big as you can do, almost standardized in the industry. Um, so there's that, right? Then there's um, the number of disks you can physically fit in vertically, um, which gives you the other component of area. And we, we're approaching the limit there. We're on a 
a very solid tendis platform that's mm -hmm. um, uh, been highly leveraged now for a few generations and um, really we're coming to the limit the ability to put in more discs vertically um, and that comes with you know how thin you can get the discs and everything else um, right. but adding more area is really not a good um, good way to scale our industry um, by adding more components um, you know, we stress our supply chain. Um, it's more difficult to build. You've got yield associated with additional heads. So every time we add discs and heads, it's not something we do lightly and not something we particularly want to do for us or our customers. It just makes it the whole aspect of drive design more challenging. So that's the area component. Uh, and then on the aerial density side of it, perpendicular recording is really is reaching that limit. So what I mean by that is, um, Fundamentally, what really defines hard drive technology is really the media. Think about it as a media. Think, I mean, because tape, tape is a media, NAND has a media structure, and disk has a media structure. And we have a sputtered system where we sputter on grains onto layers on disks. Um, and that magnetics has a coercivity, and the grain sizes can be pushed to a certain level to which, beyond which, if we shrink them further, they just don't, they're not, no longer stable. For, for long enough. So what that means is, while we may be able to write them, they won't stay in that orientation and they can actually flip. They become unstable and and the bits flip and that's absolutely what we can't have happen, right? We can't be in a situation <laughs> where- sort of, sort of a fundamental concern for hard drives or absolutely. any storage media, right? Um, so that's where we're getting to. We're getting really to the point where the media coercivity is not high enough uh, in, in the materials we're using to sustain that stability. Um, mm -hmm. So while we, we made that change to perpendicular recording, we, we chose the material and it served us very well, and we've been miniaturizing everything. As you miniaturize the media and you miniaturize the grains, um, and there's two components to that too. The, so the grains get smaller and there's the thermal stability, but then the right structure, the, the pole that you use to magnetically write it, has to also reduce in size to, to match with the size of the, the media structures. And as you reduce that, um, you can get less flux out of it, right? It's a smaller tip. Think of just sharpening a pencil. You're becoming very, very small in the tip of the electromagnet you're using to, to generate the flux. And so now you've got a, a situation where you have very small, potentially unstable grains and uh, a very, very small right pole that can't really generate enough flux. And that's kind of where you're getting to now, um, obviously, a, a, the, the products we have now are super reliable, super robust. We, we, we make sure all that's true. But as we look forward in terms of generating, like you say, the next two terabytes, we're getting to that point where we just can't get there with the perpendicular recording, recording technology. Well, so to, you could you know, theoretically solve this with larger platters, taller drives. Is, is the three and a half inch form factor obviously has been around for decades at this point. Is that the right shape going forward for hard drive media? Yeah, it's a great question. Something we always look at. It's just very, very difficult to justify that change in the form factor. Um, it's like you said, three and a half inch has is the de facto that's been around for a very long time. Systems are aligned that way. Our supply chain is aligned that way. Um, now. Clearly, with our new customer base um, and very big cloud vendors, there's more potential opportunity to do something different, uh, do something new. Um, but in terms of the economics of how you scale storage, uh, I mean, one way would be, for example, just, just create a two-inch high drive instead of a one-inch, right? You could just go vertically, and you could have a single sure. connector. And absolutely, that could be done, right? There's nothing saying we couldn't do that. We could put 20 disks in there, for example, instead of 10. Um, you get some savings because you have a single connector and you know single PCBA and, and that kind of thing. But it really doesn't. Um, it's not the greatest way for us to scale. Um, it's much much better for us to invest in scaling aerial density than scaling area. Um, it just is hard for our customers. Uh, it's hard for us to yield those products. You you end up with think about now we have twenty heads in a drive. You end up with forty heads in a drive. You know that the it. The test time associated with even processing and building those drives become ex extremely long. Um, so while we're always open to exploring opportunities um, in terms of new form factors, um, 
we're always you know looking at archival solutions relative to this technology and how you can leverage those into those spaces. Uh, but but right now the three and a half inch form factor is really hard to beat. It, it is so pervasive in the industry and the supply chains have been honed sure. that that it, it just makes sense for us to really stay there. Yeah, and I, I only bring it up because I think if we look at the flash side of the house, we're really seeing this transitional pain right now. In even there from a from an engineering and design perspective, you could argue, you know, making a skinnier or a different rectangle or whatever in, in uh, PCB and NAND is a heck of a lot easier uh, than what you would have to do on a hard drive side to, to reform that shape, right? Right. Um, but the transition to this um, to these EDSFF drives has been really bumpy for the industry. Enterprise server guys are struggling with it. They made a call, you know, largely on on E3S. But who knows? I mean, if that's if that's the long term answer for the next generation of of SSD uh, form factors, we know the hyperscalers love E1S, and they do all sorts of different things. Like as you mentioned, with OCP coming up. Uh, in, in just a few days, there'll be lots of conversation about new different ways to consume storage. Um, but you know, the, the hyperscalers drive a lot of that, uh, but still the, the, uh, the big ISG firms that, that make these systems you know, have to make design decisions too. So it's, uh, it is a bit of a challenge to, to, to move off of you know, one size or shape onto something else. Yeah, I think you know, clearly the design decisions on SSD and disk are a little bit different on that, right? In terms of we have some constraints that they don't have. Um, and, and OCP is a very interesting forum uh, for everybody to really collaborate. I mean, open standards are very, very important. We really believe in those. I mean, we need scale in our industry to survive and thrive. And um, OCP is a good way of, of doing that. We obviously have standards with SATA and SAS and other places, but OCP is a really great forum to, to have those conversations about what next generations could look like. And, and uh, you know, we'll be there and we'll be talking to the industry and, and you know, aligning on what their needs are for the future. I mean, we, we want to have those conversations. Uh, and if it makes sense to do something different, we'll absolutely be having those conversations and be right in the middle of those. So speaking of, of OCP, because you guys are very much in the middle of it, I've been... Uh, the last couple of years and the NVMe hard drive is something that uh, seems to be uh, of interest. There was a, a session that, that uh, one of your guys actually delivered last year on the progress and, and had a device with an NVMe connection on the hard drive. Do you have any insights there in terms of, you, know, you mentioned SATA SAS, but is, is NVMe really a thing for hard drives or can it be a thing? Or is this just a whimsical exploration at the, the behest of OCP members? So I would say watch this space. I think we, we're certainly excited about it. We're really excited that we have the control in our, in our silicon. We have complete vertical integration in our company, and we've, we've been able to demonstrate that capability and, and put out um, some demo units into the industry to have that, start having that conversation. Um, we, we, at the moment, don't have anything to announce relative to products in that area. It's the, very much a market exploration activity. Uh, but we're definitely getting some good feedback. I mean, as you know, you know, NVMe is it's really the interface of the future, should we say. You know, it's definitely very much being standardized around the SSD. Um, so we're trying to decide ourselves with the industry, does it make sense to add that third interface or not? Uh, so, yeah, nothing really to announce there. We're still continuing to explore and see the industry with samples and, and see what makes sense, uh, obviously. In the future, we think that there could be a good opportunity to, to converge around a single interface and, and all the um, simplification that could drive just by getting all storage behind one interface. But obviously, we've, we've had a long history with SAS and SATA. They've served us very, very well. And we don't you know, see that, that it would be an absolutely quick transition to something new. But No, clearly not. We, we do hear, though, from system design, you know, engineers that, man, sure would be nice to have just one, <laughs> one interface to design around. It would simplify, you know, motherboard design and, and you know, a number of cabling and, and other, other challenges. Uh, so the appeal seems obvious. Uh, 
and it's good to hear that you guys are still involved there and that 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 you know that's kind of fun for to think about for hard drives to to have the interface not for uh you know 7000 megabytes a second but to have it for for simplicity and and uniformity potentially in interface yeah absolutely absolutely we agree it's just a case of obviously getting enough um uh, enough of the market to agree in the, in terms of the timing and what that may, looks like relative to system design and, and but yeah very and we're, we're keen to lead that conversation and uh, uh, you know very interested to hear feedback from we've been talking to OEMs the cloud vendors and and uh, and we'll see where it goes um, watch this space yeah I think it'll be fun to watch <laughs> and uh, you know, to your point I mean this is an OCP topic but I'm sure you're obviously talking to others outside of OCP. But, I mean, to be fair, if Azure comes on board and says, okay, we're all in on NVMe hard drives, sell us 10 million, then <laughs> that accelerates the process, right? And, and the, uh, the hyperscalers have uh, dramatic influence in uh, what you and other uh, storage vendors produce because you know, the, just the sheer volume that they, they can command. So that'll be fun. All right, so I, I, I diverted a little bit off of, um, uh, of technology on the, uh, on the media. Uh, we've got a question that uh, came in from, from one of our listeners live on, on Discord about SMR. So SMR has been around for a couple of years now and was, was billed as a, my take on it was billed as sort of a bridge to get us more capacity before we were ready to, to adopt the next gen of, of Hammer or Mammer or, or whatever other uh, recording technologies were out there. Can you talk a little bit about SMR and, and how that's gone and, and what the future looks like for shingled magnetic? Yeah, so SMR was a, a great innovation. Um, you know, we've shipped a lot of SMR drives. Um, back to a little bit to just to describe it, um, you know, if you imagine back to my analogy of the pencil sharpener and the, the right pole, right? One advantage it gives us is allows us to use slightly wider, bigger writers, right? Because we're essentially shingling, right? So we're, we're writing wider tracks, which allows us to use wider write elements, generate more flux. So there is, there's good things about it from a recording physics point of view in terms of being able to shingle and, and create. The net net is once you start shingling those tracks together, you create smaller tracks. So still challenges on the read side because you still need to read the narrower track but it gives you some relief on the right side and allows you to pack the track slightly further together. Um, so as I say, we've we've had SMR technology. We feel like we have a lot of competitive products in that area. Um, but as you said, it's, it is a somewhat of a one-time additive gain um, to PMR technology or CMR, we'd say it, but um, it's a one-time push um, and it does have some customer implications. So there are some customers that that value that gain and they want to adapt to it. So um, there are some restrictions around SMR technology relative to how you write. You've, you've got to write in bands and zones. Um, so great technology, uh, like you said, it, it was um, a good way of being able to, to essentially eke some more capacity out of the end of our perpendicular magnetic recording paradigm that we're in where we want to shrink grains, we want to shrink our poles, and we can't quite get SMR, it gives us a good boost. So um, good technology, using it, there's certain customers that, that want to use it, we'll support them with that. Um, but all along, um, we wanted to get to something else, right? We, we wanted that next big step in, in S-curve, in growth. Think of SMR as you can take your CMR growth and you just put a line vertically above it at the same DC offset. Right. And that's what SMR is, right? It's, it's, a, it's an additive gain that comes with a little bit of complexity that, that mm -hmm. for, for the customers that want that to, to achieve that gain. Um, but what we want to do is get on another, we want to shift the curve. We, we want to change the conversation and move it up. Um, and that's, that's where we get into our heat-assisted magnetic recording. And that's where that's the cusp we're on now. Um, right. but yeah, SMR, great technology, absolutely support it. Um, but it doesn't fundamentally change the growth rate. It, it changes the um, amount of capacity you can achieve on any given drive. Okay. So, so heat-assisted hammer, as uh, as the short form uh, is known, 
You guys, Seagate's been pretty public about your intent here uh, on earnings calls. I believe you guys have talked about that, about the intent to launch a 30 or 30 plus terabyte hammer hard drive. It, that gives you the leap from 2022 to uh, a, a new media and a new platform. That's the jump you're talking about that, that really gets material fast for, for hard drive capacity, yeah? Yeah, so this is going to like change the game we think right it's a it's our next you know big change in particular recording was really the last one we've had incremental obviously all the way along smr has given us a bit of a gain but this really does change the game in terms of the where we can go um yeah we're just super excited and proud of what we've been able to achieve we were looking back we started working on this 23 years ago it was like <laughs> Just the blink, blink of an eye. <laughs> um, yeah, where people were shining lasers on heads and spin stands, you know, and, and to think of where we've come from there uh, has really been incredible. It, it takes time, right, to, to mature these technologies. It, it isn't simple, let's say, back to where we started in terms of commodities. To get it to a point where everything's integrated and everything's working at full reliability in data center 24-7 takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from the team. Um, and for us to have got it to the point now where we are and we're really just right, we're launching, it's, it's there, we're ready, um, is really great. You know, we're, we're just super proud of it. Well, tell me about, about the technology and, and what should people know? Because as you said before, when we were talking about the, the shift in technologies, especially in the data center, there's always apprehension, right? I don't want to be you know, first one in on, on something new because it's, it's scary or, or, or I don't understand it or, or whatever. And that's not just storage technologies, it's fabrics, it's, it's everything. Um, wh how, how does Hammer different from what we have today in terms of the media, how it's, how it's written and read to, or re written to, read from? What are, what are the, the top fundamental changes? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing to note, really, from the consumer side, customer side, there is no change. Um, that's and that's the great thing about it is uh, there is nothing we're asking the customer to do. Uh, it it operates like any other CMR drive today, no with no restrictions, no protocol changes, um, no restrictions in terms of how you write and read. So that's really the the great power. Really, is a drop in plug and place replacement for a higher capacity. Now, obviously, behind the curtain, there's a lot of things going on, right? Um, so, so talking about the technology, the fundamental difference is now we've introduced an assist into the right process. Uh, so it's called heat assist. That's the vacuum we used. Uh, but it's actually a, a plasmodic effect. Uh, it's uh, So it, it is heat, ultimately, that, that does the magic. but we essentially take a, a laser integrated, fully integrated laser system, and we guide that down right to that right pole that I talked about before, which is relatively conventionally the same. But now you've got a very localized heat generating mechanism um, through this plasmonic effect where light and electrons all can combine. And we essentially heat up the media very locally underneath the right pole. And Managing that process takes a lot in terms of electronics and integration in the wafer process and getting the light exactly when you where you want it when you want it to be, and we solved all those problems. And now we have this ability to heat the media. Now, so what what does heating the media give you the ability to do? It now allows us to change the materials of the of the media, and that's the really the quantum leap we're talking about. Okay. So now we've gone from the the media coercivity that we had before. So now a completely different media type, much, much higher coercivity, very different media structure that, that if you tried to write that media with today's conventional heads, you wouldn't even be able to record on it because the coercivity is so high. And by heating that local spot, what, what heat does is it locally reduces coercivity. So that just very, very temporarily within two nanoseconds, the heat lowers the coercivity, allows our conventional right pole to then flip the bit and then it cools so instantaneously that it's trapped there. And that's really the recording physics change that we've made. That's amazing. I mean, it, it sounds like Star Trek level stuff of, you know, ripping open a wormhole so you can slip through and letting it, you know, close behind you. I mean, it, it's really, 
We actually do have some. We have some videos that look like Death Stars. I don't know if you saw the one that was posted recently, but um, no, we'll have to like link, that, right? link to Death it. Death Star laser. That, that, that's the analogy you can think of. Um, no, that would that would be cool. Um, it, it's just so hard to to wrap to wrap your head around. I think the. I mean, you talked about the engineering that went into it over a, a brief twenty three years, but the execution in terms of heating that local area and not uh, just so many technology challenges, not too much, not, not, not enough. And, and then being able to cool that down quickly. And when you say heat, what is, what does that mean? Do you have a, a thermal spec there? Is, is that something you can share? I'm just sort of curious, you know, at what sort of scale we're talking. Yeah. So when we see heat, it's so localized. I mean, you're, we're talking about nanometers of, of, of area that we're heating that it really materially in terms of the way we talk about heat of drives and data centers, it just, it doesn't even register on that scale. So, um, but locally we're talking about like 800 degrees Fahrenheit or something, right? It's a very, very, very hot, very, very, very quick, but it, it's really, um, there to, to make that bit flip and it, you can't really register it in the drive. Um, so it, it's almost a bit of a disservice to call it heat assisted memory recording because a lot more that goes on into that. But yeah, in terms of controlling the spot size and the electronics that go behind it and, and, and how that media is, how the heat is sunk into the media and control, there's just so many pieces to get into that. But that's what we've been doing after over the last 20 years. And, and we've really ramped up that investment the last few years. We've been just running so many experiments and you just have to put in the hard work to really figure out what works and what doesn't work. And, um, and now we've converged onto a very, very, very reliable design. So to your point about what do people need to know in terms of risk and everything, we, we believe that we've, we've done the work. Uh, we have the data, we have the, the, the test beds, and we, we have drives in, in customer qualifications as we speak. Um, that's going very, very well. Um, to the point, it's like, say, from a host interface, there's really nothing to do. And, and we obviously have to convince our customers and ourselves that that we've built something rock solid in, in these environments. They, but Seagate has a real good reputation of that relative to our enterprise drives where we've got a long history and we have a lot of confidence now that we've got this right and we're going to be able to put out a product that really changes the game um, in terms of the growth. And this is just the start. So we're going to have this big right. step change, but we now think once we get onto this new media, a bit like think about the original perpendicular media, now we're on a miniaturization journey where we can take what we got and we can now we can further miniaturize and, and grow further. We have, um, we do aerial density demonstrations on spin stands and we now have demonstrated five terabytes per disk. We, we're starting to use terabytes per disk as, as a good way of really um, explaining aerial density. I think it's just a very neat way of doing that. Um, so now we're, at, you know, we're launching our three terabyte per disk, but we've already got spin stand demonstrations in our labs at five terabytes per disk, which would underpin 50 terabyte drives in the future. So, well, that's, um, that's a good point there. So when we think about the physical construct of a three and a half inch hard drive, you're at 10 platters now, is it right to still think about hammer drives in the same way with that same platter stacking and, and arm arms kind of uh, moving around? Arch just structurally understanding the technology at the tip of that arm is different, but structurally, are they, are they that similar? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Really the same. In fact, we, we've got a lot of leverage in our first generation drive. We're going to be launching. We're going to have a lot of leverage from our current, um, drives, our uh, tenders platform. Uh, so mm -hmm. that keeps that economy of scale. So really no, nothing different materially there. Um, a lot of it is in the way, you know, either in the way for process to, to, to get the, the laser integrated and in the electronics and everything else that goes with it. So, but yeah, if you, if you did open up one, it would look like a conventional drive in that same way. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so this is a, you know, maybe a silly question, but the drives today that you ship are sealed with helium inside. Something strikes me that perhaps helium and this heat may not be the best combo or, or am I missing something there? No, no, helium's fine. Uh, that's <laughs> it's not hydrogen, right? <laughs> so, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah helium so, is, is is a great is a great gas. We we've been using helium for a long time. We've had that with seal our sealed drive. So, um, yeah, that that's no problem. 
So when it comes to hammer, I've got another question from the group here uh, about the challenges in thermal and magnetic stability in developing hammer. I mean, obviously those are concerns that, that you've worked on over the last couple decades to get here. But is was there something at, at the onset that was especially daunting or, or maybe even not even possible in the early days until technology mm -hmm. matured as you went through this? Yeah, so the... And there's been a lot published on this already. The the challenge mainly has been in in terms of directing that amount of heat to the interface and getting it to survive that amount of heat. That's really where the the big challenge for Hammer has been. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of things done, which obviously I can't disclose those all those things. But uh, there are a lot of things done in that area to really improve it. So um, a lot of experiments, but that, that's really been the fundamental uh, piece of, of Hammer. We've, we've had the ability to generate the, the media for a long time, um, and we've had all the components. It's been the challenge of, of getting to the point where we can deliver the, that, that level of heat that we require to produce the coercivity, like we discussed, in a very reliable way. And um, a lot of design details have gone into to achieving that, but that's where we're at, and we've we've come a long way in the last 10 years we've we've come orders of magnitude in terms of the ability to for, for heads to be able to operate under that those conditions and and now we're we're there we feel like we've got a, a very robust design solution so when when i think about hammer and the way the way you talk about it it's it, it presents the next leap uh, forward in in density for for hard drives um you know starting with something in the 30s range and then growing from there over time as the same density benefits come to you in terms of platters and media and all those other things that you talked about at the beginning. Um, is there a play for hammer in smaller drives or is this really a, a, a 30 and up kind of technology? Oh, yeah, absolutely there is. Um, we, we, we definitely see a future where we can leverage this technology really across our portfolio of products. Uh, reducing components is just a great thing for the industry and for our world, right? Our supply chain, um, the more we can do to reduce the number of components in our drives is from a sustainability point of view, uh, there's just a lot, so many benefits. So uh, that's, and that's why we like to talk about capacity per disk because it's just so relevant in some of these smaller capacity drives, right? Once we get to four terabytes per disk, we could generate a single platter, four terabyte per disk drive, right? We could do those things. So absolutely, we see a future where uh, we can start generating lower disk discount um, platforms that that can leverage the technology and, and reduce the number of components that we need to, to ship with our drives, um, which clearly is a, a cost reduction to the system and a, just a general TCO advantage to the industry. So yeah, Hammer won't just be reserved for the, the max payload customer that we're, obviously right. we're, that's where we want to launch, but uh, the future will definitely be looking to, um, to leverage it beyond that. Speaking of the environmental uh, issues, do you, do you have any data on what, on what power consumption looks like? And not specific to any one product, but you know, in, in your early dev models or your, your qual customer qual samples for Hammer, is there a change in power consumption for that drive versus your, your leading, you know, Exos 22 or, or whatever today in, in terms of, you know, just raw power consumption? Yeah, no, I mean, similar. I mean, there's, there's similar power. It's, um, but the way we, we like to look at power really is through the lens of a, a bigger deployment. Uh, the, so the biggest real knob in terms of data center power is, is aerial density and capacity, right? So if we can start replacing, I mean, there are still a lot of four and eight terabyte drives out there in data centers. Um, we can start replacing those with 30 terabyte drives. Just think about power reduction that, that generates for the data center. Uh, it's, it's really immense, not just for the device, you know, obviously the device is somewhat similar, but from uh, the fans and the air handling and the number of servers you, you need, um, it, it does mount up very, very quickly. So um, when we start running TCO calculations on these large capacity drives, it, it really becomes very, very powerful in terms of how, you know, watts per terabyte look on a 
large deployment. Uh, so we talked about a little bit about sustainability and, and supply chain relative to low discount products, certain industries. In the mass capacity deployments, the, the TCO advantage just from the reduction in the surrounding infrastructure around the device become very, very significant very, very quickly. And that's why you've been seeing these actually, I mean, you referenced before that the, the, like the two terabyte increments and how they um, maybe didn't feel significant to some people, but the capacity equation in the TCO of a mass capacity de deployment is such a big lever that, that that's the reason we released those capacities and those increments because there's a big demand for that latest two terabytes, right? It's such a big, big knob in that equation of TCO. Um, so that's why we think it's such a game changer for us to be able to get to 30 plus and with a future of 50 plus. It's, um, well, to be fair, I mean, I picked on you just a little bit <laughs> on the two terabyte thing, because when you're in the, when you're in the industry, it's like going from 20 to 22, obviously that's only a, a 10% gain, right? But to your, your point is, is very fair. If you've got customers or, or there are deployments that are sitting on fours or sixes or eights, when you make that leap, it's not a 10% leap. It's a you know, 100 or more percent gain in, in, uh, in capacity. So, you know, we get sort of myopic on what's the latest and greatest today, not necessarily what's been in the data center for three and a half years that's due for uh, an upgrade. But the, the environmental point is, is very salient, I think, because we're, we're talking about everywhere else in the data center, how to get more density out of your rack deployments. And if we're talking about GPU servers, that means liquid cooling. If we're talking about other things, like other technologies, it's all about in that rack U, how much can I squish in there efficiently? And then can my rack deliver the power to, uh, uh, to handle those things? And, and I know you guys are very much a part of that too. We've even seen uh, OCP designs with their storage server with liquid cooled hard drives. So it's not you know, certainly not something I'm, I'm sure you're ready to pitch today as, a, as an industry standard, but there are all sorts of things going on. And you're, you're to this point progressive growth and now a, a, a giant jump in, in capacity will go a long way to terabytes per rack U, which is, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, and that's like I say we we're a hardware company, right? We we focus on hardware. We think that's what we do really well. Um, we invest our money on really fundamental solving the physics problems of the storage industry, and like I said, the everything really does come back to aerial density uh, in our industry. If we can find ways of improving aerial density, the gains just compound. You know, we can take components out of the drive, we can take components out of the rack, we can lower the power of the data center. It's such a powerful knob um, that, you know, that's really where we want to invest our money. We, we want to create devices that have the highest aerial density to keep cost reduction coming down in the disk world um, and really make that a real differentiator for our company. And that's why we've, we've spent the money we have over the years and invested in this, this technology because we, we saw, and the industry is aligned, right? This this is the technology that will take disk into the future. Um, so we're really just excited to launch it and and work with our customers on it. We've already started, we've been working on it with them for actually several years, really, that we don't do anything in a silo in this world. We have very, very strong relationships with our, with our largest customers and we've been seeding those samples into the industry and getting feedback and and like I said, the qualifications are now running really well. But we, yeah, that for them, scale, I mean, it's such a massive scale, right? And anything we can do to improve that TCO equation for them. I mean, everyone wants to buy GPUs these days, right? Everybody, that's the latest thing. I think everybody saw NVIDIA's stock is doing pretty well, right? There's a lot of, a lot of money going that direction. And, um, and that's great for the industry, right? I, I think... While obviously we'd love, love some more of that money to come to us, we think it will come around, right? That once they start building out these GPU clusters and Gen AI starts really generating the data we think it will generate, uh, the amount of data demand out there is just massive. We, I mean, we see projections of you know nine zettabytes out in 2028. Some, I mean, it, some very very big numbers from where we are today, um, beyond what our, our 
our industry really can generate. We, so we, we need to keep our foot to the gas. We need to be innovating. We need to be riding these curves and this, this technology because the demand is going to be real and it'll be out there. And uh, we just don't feel like we can slow down. So we're, um, we think we have a very compelling value proposition with this. We're, we're just really excited to get it to market now. So all, all I heard in that was Seagate's developing a GPU. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that accurate? We'd love to have one to sell right now. I think uh, they're probably, I imagine they're probably sold out over at NVIDIA right now. But um, uh, we, yeah, we're, we're well aware of some of the pain points around uh, getting access to the GPUs. Well, the, the, the point on, on Gen AI is real or what we used to call you know, analytics or business intelligence, you know, maybe as few as eight months ago. Um, but uh, the, there's a, for mature enterprises, there's a severe lack of interest to delete or remove any data because whatever my guys or, or AI team is, is working on now could very much make use of data that before we couldn't analyze or couldn't analyze well or didn't understand or whatever. So the notion of hanging on to data and keeping it in some place that's relatively easy to access to funnel back into these GPUs at any moment is, uh, is a pretty real concern. So again, I think we go back to the density argument of the more data I can keep online, keep available, the, the better in terms of uh, an intelligent enterprise these days. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good way of looking at it. We look at it the same way. There's, we see two trends. You know, one is people are going to want to hang, hang on more, like you said, not just for kind of what could I do with it in the future if I have a better model to train with. That's one reason. There's a lot of legal reasons too, based uh, you know, um, once you start training models with data and then you start using those models, people want to know where the data came from and generate the models. And so there's lots of legal pieces. There's a lot of geography. Uh, geopolitical pieces to that too so that that's definitely a real trend and then the other trend on the generative side i don't think anybody knows yet really where that's going to go um but now with the ability to generate video automatically through ai we, you know that that's another trend we're watching really really closely so both of those just a net positive for storage i mean people i think some people look at ai and just they look at ssds and and you know, some of the fast stories that needs to be attached to these systems. And at a certain level, you just say, well, that's not really disk, right? That's just, that's the training systems, it's NVMe SSDs. We don't really look at that same way. I mean, we, we look at it that that SSD tier really is a cache, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a cache that you're using to take data from somewhere. You put it into that layer, you train on it, and then what do you do with it? You don't generally keep it in that, that layer anymore. So it depends on how you look at it, right? There's definitely driving demand and, and it will drive demand for high speed SSDs. But relative to the whole industry equation, that's we think it's just good for the whole industry because like you said, it's there's going to be plenty of need to to keep the data that, that trains the models and, and store the data that gets generated by the models. So um, well, I mean to be fair, you, we see SSDs used primarily with GPU servers and we we do it ourselves here, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we did a deep dive on Core Vault earlier this year, the 106 uh, bay hard drive chassis, smart JBOD. And, you know, if we're talking about going from 20 terabyte, 22 terabyte drives in that today to 30 plus, you know, in the relatively near term with uh, hammer enabled drives, now you're looking at three, three and a half petabytes of storage that in aggregate is actually pretty dang fast. And, and if you guys, you know, and, and others in the industry start thinking about, okay, well, you know, we've thought about GPU Direct as really a speed problem uh, that can only be addressed by a handful of SSDs, but what if I had three and a half petabytes or, or, or whatever that's actually able to deliver 15, 18 gig a second? I mean, that's a different kind of conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, it, it often gets missed, right? That on an individual device basis, this clearly relative to SSDs, there's just no real comparison, right? It's not in the same realm relative performance. But like you said, once you put a hundred together in a, in a box, they, they're pretty pretty performant, right? You're talking about, about like you said, um, gigabytes per second throughput. Um, our Cobalt system is really an incredible system and um, we are gonna be using that to deploy our hammer. We're gonna be leading that in terms of making that system capable and, and of shipping our hammer drives um, 
and now we have that you know both in a 1.2 meter and a one meter variant so we, we can we can deploy that everywhere um but you're right i mean in aggregate disk is not a it's not low performance um and sometimes that gets missed so in terms of throughput uh needs where we want to stream a lot of data into a system uh, these disk-based systems like Cobalt are actually very, very uh, powerful. And uh, and it does beg the question sometimes, do you even need that, cache, that SSD cache layer? You may not, right, in those cases. Well, it, it, I think fundamentally it, it depends, right? But right. <laughs> you, you, your point in mind, I think, is that you can't discount the, the spinning rust, as you uh, would adoringly call it, uh, because it's, you know, in units of one... You know, tops out at you know whatever 285 megasecond. When you aggregate 106 or 53 in each controller, the uh, the speeds are pretty impressive, as as we found out uh, hands on with that system. So so there are other ways to to skin that big data cat for sure. Uh, I know we're coming up on on our time together, but I don't want to miss out on one other. Uh, technology or, or uh, uh, hard drive technology that's, that's a bit of an anomaly to, to many, multi-actuator. Can you give us an update on, on what's going on there and, and how Seagate sees that part of the, the industry? Yeah, so that, that one's actually very near and dear to my heart. I actually ran that program uh, through. Oh, yeah? um, so I, very, I know it very well. Um, and again, it amazing amount of technology went into that seagate led that that transition led that design um for people unaware essentially we split the actuator into two inside the drive so now we have a parallelization we have two active actuators that can access the drive at the same time um essentially giving us double the performance so like you mentioned we typically are about 250 megabytes per second on a the od of a three and a half inch disc now we're at 500 which is pretty amazing out of a drive if once you can get to that streaming capability. Uh, yeah, we're very proud of it. We've sold a lot, and it's it's we have customers, and it's it's out there. Um, in terms of where it goes, we we're, we're still watching it. Um, we we absolutely know there is a trend relative to performance density that is real. Uh, once you get into these very multi-tenant environments where lots of users are using the same device. Um, the metric of IOPS per terabyte, performance per terabyte, it becomes very real. Mm -hmm. And we, we're acknowledging that we haven't really, for the several years, increased the performance side of that equation. Uh, and now we're even further increasing the terabyte side of that equation with Hammer. So what that does do is it brings the performance per terabyte down. So the amount of performance and the amount of access think of it the sla that you could generate um, off that device uh, can be a challenge for some customers so we're watching it and and um watch this space i would say we have the technology it's we're very very happy about how we deployed it it went very very well um we we think it's you know a really really clever way of getting more out of it i mean we're not we're not clearly trying to compete with flash there right i mean if you're doubling the iops of a drive you're not achieving the multiples you require all of the flash, but that's really not the right. point, right? It's, it's enabling, so think about it this way, if you have a, say you had a 16 terabyte multi-actuated drive, um, that's the equivalent of having two eight terabyte drives. I mean, you can, you can double the amount of deployable capacity for the same amount of performance. And so it, it's actually a very, very powerful knob for customers that become constrained by the amount of performance they um, they need out of these devices. Um, and so, you know, we're monitoring it as we go. It's definitely one of part of our toolbox of designs we have available to us. Um, it's a case of, you know, how we align with our customers relative to, you know, the next products and how that goes. Um, but absolutely, we can see a world where we need more of that in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's lots of opportunity. You said Hammer has been 20 plus years in development. And so we're just seeing that and you know, come to fruition in 2023, hopefully. Uh, you, be, you must have a, a dozen or more other projects that, that have started since 2000 that are in various stages of, uh, of learning that, uh, that'll keep building on that technology or building what's next. So there's, uh, 
a tremendous amount of opportunity there. But uh, this has been great. I appreciate you, you you diving in deep with us on on some of these technologies. And when when Hammer's out and, and we've got some, I'd love to have you back and and talk a little bit more about it and understand performance profiles and understand you know any other you know nerdy nuances of the drives that uh, that we should all uh, you know, the enthusiasts should should be aware of. Yeah, it'd be great to come back, and it'll be it'll be really good to like I say we're getting excited now that we're sort of this, we have this coming out party right that we're getting to the point where we can really um, sample these into the industry more widely, and and really have that conversation about you know that this isn't just vaporware right it's not these aren't PowerPoint slides this is this is real um, and and it's there and it's ready to be deployed and. Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to have that ongoing conversation once we can actually get some hardware in your hands. Yeah, absolutely. When you have that party, let us know. We'll be uh, we'll be out to see you in uh, in Shakopee or wherever it is. But uh, we'll try and make sure it's not in the in the winter. We'll make sure it's not. I, ideally, not. But you know, what? I wouldn't ask you to hold off your product launch, so I'm not cold. Yeah. Um, you know, this has been really great. I appreciate it. The uh, the the engagement on on what you guys are doing, the leadership there with with many of the technologies that you brought up is. Is fantastic for anyone that wants to learn more. Check uh, these guys out at Seagate.com. We'll link to uh, we'll find the video. We'll link to that and, and other resources that are publicly available relevant to Hammer. So we'll keep you guys up on that and uh, look forward to seeing what's next. Thanks again. Thank you.